Yeah, uh, thank you, Frida, for giving the introduction. Um, uh, so good morning, everyone, um, and happy Friday. Uh, my name is Matangi Gopalakrishnan. I'm a faculty from University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, and I'll be your moderator today for the session. And it's my pleasure to welcome our first speaker for the KOL uh, Complex Innovative Design mini series, Dr. Steve Lake. Um, Dr. Steve Lake has been a biostatistician working in drug development for over 19 years. He, for the past four years, he's been the vice president of biometrics at Wave Life Sciences, where he's been helping uh, develop potential therapies for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, Huntington disease, ALS, and frontotemporal dementia. So before joining Wave, um, Dr. Lake has extensive experience in the pharmaceutical industry. He'd been uh, in Clementia, Genzyme, and Sanofi for the past 15 years. Uh, so he will be presenting today on Bayesian adaptive clinical trial in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, so uh, welcome, Dr. Lake. Um, before I hand it over to the speaker, um, we all know we have been experts by now. Please keep your microphone on mute during the presentation. Um, to ask a question, you can use the chat option. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the session. Yeah, Dr. Lake, it's all yours now. Please go Great. ahead. Okay, well, I'll, sh I'll share my screen so we can get started. Yes. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to present and for the introduction. It's a real privilege to present to this group. <clears throat> So uh, I work at Wave Life Sciences, and I'll be presenting a Bayesian adaptive trial in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the outline of my talk is the following. I'll give a brief overview of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay, hold on just a sec. I'm just trying to figure out how I can change. There we go. Okay. Um, Brief overview of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and then I'll talk about Distance 51, which was WAVE's pivotal study to assess the safety and efficacy of suvidurcin in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'll review the study design, the statistical methods, the simulations that we conducted. As you know, this trial was selected for part of the FDA pilot program in um, complex and innovative designs. I'll talk about the experience um, as being part of that program and also some um, considerations if you're thinking about implementing an adaptive design in your clinical development programs. And then I'll have a brief summary. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a fatal X-linked genetic neuromuscular disorder characterized by progressive irreversible loss of muscle function, including in the heart and lung. About half of DMD boys lose the ability to walk before they're 15 years of age, and the vast majority do not survive beyond their 30th birthday. DMD is caused by genetic mutations in the dystrophin gene, which prevents the production of dystrophin protein, a critical component of healthy muscle function. DMD impacts one in every 5,000 newborn boys each year, and there's about 20,000 new cases annually worldwide. So if you're in drug development, you know that these then this disease then classifies as a rare disease or orphan disease um, for both the FDA and the EMA. Current disease modifying treatments have not demonstrably established clinical benefit. There have been some very contentious and controversial um, reviews of prior clinical trials, as well as controversial approvals of uh, DMD therapy. Um, so DISTANCE 51 was a phase 2-3 trial of suvidurcin, which was an investigational antisense oligo oligonucleotide, or ASO, for DMD patients amenable to exon 51 skipping. The strategy of exon exon skipping is to encourage 
the cell mach mach cellular machinery to skip over the exons with the genetic mutation to create a shortened but still functional version of dystrophin protein. In the US, there are currently three approved therapies for DMD using this approach. So I'll just try to review the schematic just to show what um, ASOs are supposed to do just because I find it absolutely amazing that we can even talk about the potential of these therapies. So many, there are many different genetic mutations in the dystrophin gene that cause uh, DMD. Some of them are deletions of specific exons. And so you can see on the left-hand side, dysfunctional, uh, over under dysfunctional splicing, the genetic mutation for this, in this schematic causes the exons to between 47 and 51 to be deleted. And so, when pre-mRNA is created, you still have obviously these exons missing. And then when the splicing mechanisms come through on the pre-mRNA pre to create mRNA, you have this stopping of the uh, splicing. And so then when the transcriptomes come, uh, tRNA come along and create the protein, that actually is disrupted and there is no dystrophin protein. For exon skipping therapy, the ASO is meant to somehow attach itself to the pre-mRNA. Pre and then when the splicing mechanism comes along, you are creating mRNA that still has these exons missing, but it is not going to disrupt the tRNA as it generates the dystrophin protein. So you'll still have, in theory, dystrophin protein. It will be truncated because it is missing some of these exons. All right, so that's, that's the lesson on um, exon skipping therapies. And so this therapy here would be an exon 51 skipping therapy, which was um, what we were trying to do for distance 51. So distance 51 had two primary objectives. The first was to evaluate the efficacy of suvidercin by assessing changes in dystrophin levels, so the actual protein. Change in dystrophin was the primary endpoint for US FDA with, um, for, for in our study for the US FDA with the potential for uh, accelerated approval. As I mentioned earlier, dystrophin increase is the basis for accelerated approval for three therapies. And so that was the primary endpoint for um, the US FDA in this study. So that was one objective. The second objective was to evaluate the efficacy of suvidercin by assessing changes in a motor function endpoint. This is measured in our case by the North Star Ambulatory Assessment or the NSAA. Demonstration of efficacy on clinical endpoints, such as either the six minute walk test or the NSAA is required for approval of DMD therapies by the EMA as well as Japan. So just briefly on the NSAA, it's a 17 item um, rating scale or a rating scale based on 17 items. These are rated by a physiotherapist on zero, one, and two with lower scores indicating less motor function. So these are just some of the exam, um, components of the NSAA. So number eight is, can you step down from a box using your right leg first? Um, 11 is, can you get up from the floor using as little support as possible and as fast as you can? These are instructions to the children um, with DMD. And you can see this is a, a depiction, a sort of a classic depiction of what they call the Gower maneuver, which is what happens with DMD boys. Their, their hips and thighs are so weak that they have to sort of get into a crawling position and then a tripod position and then walk themselves up to be able to stand up. So it's really sort of a depressing to think that these are boys between the age of eight and 15 who have this type of disability. So with the primary objectives, we then set about 
setting the goals for our study design. How could we come up with a study design that was going to support these two different primary objectives? So first, we wanted through interim analyses to provide the study an opportunity to identify a suvidersin treatment effect on dystrophin prior to study conclusion. So we wanted to uh, assess dystrophin protein increase throughout the study. And if we met um, a specific threshold, potentially file for accelerated approval while the study was ongoing. Secondly, we wanted to maximize the probability of a definitive NSAA result. So if the trial worked, if the drug worked, we wanted to make sure we were not underpowered. On the other hand, we did not want to enroll more patients than necessary. So we wanted to select statistical methods that would efficiently use the data. We also wanted to perform interim analyses to determine whether the current sample size was sufficient. So uh, I'll get into that uh, later. And then we also wanted to incorporate historical control borrowing from prior clinical trials. So I'll be talking a lot about the different adaptive design elements uh, in the trial, and I just wanted to kind of preview them here. So first, we had the early, we had the option for early demonstration of efficacy on dystrophin. We had this option to stop enrollment to the low dose arm due to insufficient efficacy, uh, and then that would uh, also render the case that we would not pool the doses for the NSAA comparison. So I should have, should have mentioned that there were two doses of suvitors and a low dose and a high dose, and we were prospectively planning to pool those doses in the NSAA comparison. If we stopped enrollment to the low dose, we would not pool the doses. Um, and then we, as I mentioned above, we also wanted to stop enrollment potentially due to a high probability of NSAA success. Uh, with based on the current patient numbers. Okay, so just briefly on distance 51 and the CID program, the FDA announced the CID program in August of 2018. Uh, at that time, we were, we were sort of bandying around different study designs, different uh, ways we wanted to try to conduct the phase three study and uh, including placebo arm augmentation and, and different um, interim analysis options for those objectives that we had formulated. When the CID program came out, <clears throat> we realized what we wanted to do was uh, partner with Barry consultants to help us formulate the study design, the statistical methods, and to conduct the simulations. They were real genuine colleagues throughout this whole process and um, it, it was great working with them. We were able to submit um, an application for the CID program for the, first, um, for the first window that they had um, open for um, the proposals, which was in September of 2018. We announced acceptance in, into the CID program in January of 2019 and then had our first of two CID, formal face-to-face -face CID meetings at the end of January, 2019. So it really, really went pretty quickly. Um, well, drug development is a tough business and we did an analysis of the open label extension to our phase one study. So we had a phase one study to select doses. All those patients ran, were transitioned to an OLE and we got biopsies, well, we assessed dystrophin increase from that OLE, and it was very clear that suvidersin was not increasing dystrophin. And so we decided to uh, discontinue the development of suvidersin. We had about 10 patients enrolled into the distance 51 pivotal study at that time. So it was really disappointing for the DMD community and to waive. And, and also to me, because I thought it, would, it was just going to be an amazing experience to, to not only work on the design and go through the CID program, but actually to implement that clinical trial and then to hopefully analyze the data and 
through approval of, of Subidursin, but that was not to be the case. So anyway, it's still important to um, describe the trial design as well as our CID experience to inform future trials and rare diseases. And one thing I've also learned in drug development is never say never. And we are currently working on an Exxon 53 skipping therapy for DMD. And we have a trial ongoing now, small phase one study. So a little bit more about the design. This is just really a, a simple schematic of the distance 51 study design. Um, the main things here are on the, we would assess the North Star ambulatory assessment at screening baseline, oops, sorry about that, baseline, baseline um, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, 36 weeks and 48 weeks. Um, biopsies were taken from um, the DMD patients at baseline and then only at one follow-up time point. And I'll get into when that timing was, but it was either going to be at 12 weeks, 22 weeks, or 36, uh, 12 weeks, 22 weeks, or 46 weeks. As I mentioned earlier, we had two Suvidersin treatment arms, a high dose and a low dose arm. The maximum sample size was going to be uh, 50 patients for the placebo arm and 50 patients for each of the Suvidersin treatment arms. The primary endpoint for the FDA was dystrophin for the EMA and PMDA was NSAA. Secondary endpoint for FDA was NSAA, and for EMA, PMDA was dystrophin protein. All patients after 48 weeks would transition to um, an open label extension study. So a little bit more about our study design goals around NSAA. Again, maximizing the probability of a definitive NSAA result. We wanted to select statistical methods that efficiently use the data so we settled on it, what is what we term or what's called in the literature a Bayesian progression model. And this provides a flexible non-parametric rate of progression to be modeled um, for the placebo patients. And then you assume a proportional treatment effect uh, for the treated patients that's that can be estimated using all available longitudinal data. This model can account for baseline covariates. And then in terms of uh, borrowing from historical data, it has a meta-analytic approach, which dynamically determines the amount of borrowing. So using a random data source effect. So the more similar the data sets are in terms of NSAA uh, change over time in placebo patients, the more borrowing that you get. The less, less similar they are, the less borrowing. Uh, in terms of performing interim analyses to determine whether the current sample size was sufficient, we sort of, sort of followed what's called the Goldilocks approach uh, described in this Broglio paper, where you do an interim analysis on the available NSAA data and determine whether or not if you completed follow-up on those patients, um, would you have a high probability of reaching your efficacy thres threshold at the end of the study? If that's high enough, then you stop the study, you stop enrollment and complete follow-up on the patients who have already been enrolled and then conduct your analysis. Um, and also I've mentioned that we wanted to incorporate the capability to augment the placebo arm with historical data. So, the steps were to gain access to historical data sets. We made a decision that we would, um, we would only use placebo arm data from clinical trials. We would not use some of the natural history data sets that, um, that are out there in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So with those historical data sets, we apply the key inclusion criteria to increase the similarity between the historical and the placebo data sets. Uh, for example, we applied the, some of the key inclusion criteria for our study were based, they were, they, they were age-based um, measures of motor function or ambulation, as well as steroid use. Uh, we adjusted for covariates in the statistical model to account for differences. 
uh, in baseline covariates, and then again, use the method that appropriately accounts for borrowing from external data sets. So this is the model, uh, the Bayesian progression model for NSAA. Um, so what we do is you, with this model, you assume a piecewise linear model for the placebo decline in the NSAA. So each 12 week period is modeled as a beta K with the sum of all beta Ks equal to the total decline over 48 weeks, again, in the placebo arm. And so that's, that's this term right here, the sum over K beta K, uh, sorry, sum over Ks of the beta Ks. Um, e to the theta T quantifies the proportional NSAA slowing for each treatment group. So you have this e to the theta t. e to the theta t is uh, one for the placebo arm. And then we also had that restriction that it, the uh, low dose and the, and the high dose arm um, were S pooled. So we would just set that theta one and theta two for low dose and high dose respectively um, were equal to each other. And so this has a, a multiplicative you're, you're multiplying this um, factor by the, um, the sum of the, the piecewise beta Ks. Delta S is a random data source effect to account for between data source variability in the NSAA progression rate in the placebo arm. Um, and this was its, its prior distribution. Um, gamma I, so YIJ is obviously NSAA for the IF patient at the JF time point, gamma I was the uh, sort of the patient specific baseline NSAA. Um, I can't remember which, I think this is ADA or NU, I can't remember. Um, I need to bush, bone up on my Greek alphabet. Um, this is the random um, change, sorry, the random um, patient specific multiplicative effect it's sort of like a random uh, slope effect, but in this in this context, it's multiplying by the progression on the beta Ks. Um, alpha XI, XI are uh, the standardized covariates, baseline covariates that we included in the model. And uh, EIJ, that's the, um, the treatment group and data source specific variability in the NSAA, residual variability. Um, in terms of NSAA comparisons, um, the for enrollment stop. So again, you know that sort of inspired by the Goldilocks design. Uh, what we wanted to do was test whether or not the treatment effect, this EPS e to the e to the um, e theta two, was that less than some threshold. And this threshold was sample size dependent or interim sample size dependent. So the way we derive these thresholds, so this is not really a truly a predictive probability. It's, it's more, we derived these um, DRRNs through simulation at the design stage. And it is really the posterior mean of the treatment effect necessary to achieve, uh, well, <laughs> necessary to ensure that efficacy success is declared given the interim sample size of N. So again, so what we would do is we'd simulate, simulate the NSAA for placebo patients and for treated patients. Um, and then we would look at, given a specific sample size, what was the treatment effect necessary to meet the efficacy threshold? And then that, treatment effect was used here. And so our estimated treatment effect, the probability of the, the, um, the treatment effect from the current data had to be that it was less than or, or greater than really the, a larger treatment effect, um, that had to be greater than 0 0.90. So that is, a, that is a high threshold to um, stop enrollment. And you, you can, we'll see how that high threshold played out in the simulations later. Um, comparisons for treatment efficacy. Again, this is just basic that whether or not the treatment effect 
um, was less than one conditional on the data had to be greater than 0 0.975. Okay, so potential sources of historical data. Um, I, sorry, is there someone talking? I'm trying to... I'll just okay. Um, so potential sources of historical data. Um, we were granted access to the pivotal trial placebo data for Tadalafil and Adalorin. Access to these data sets was greatly facilitated by the Critical Path Institute. Duchesne Regulatory Science Consortium, which was led at the time by Jane Larkindale. So um, we, we at WAVE were members of this consortium and worked to get access to the placebo arm data from these particular trial, from these two trials. Pfizer had conducted a phase two study for doma, domagrozumab, which, um, which failed. And uh, we were in negotiations with Pfizer to access that data. While we were in negotiating, while we were in negotiations, they considerately conducted analyses on the data that they had that helped us inform our simulations. So this is. Uh, uh, some violin plots of the baseline covariates in the Tadalafil and Adalorin study. Um, so you can see these baseline covariates of age, BMI, steroid duration, the NSAA at baseline, six minute walk test, and then some other functional tests, the time to walk or run 10 meters, time to stand, and the time to climb. And so you can see the um, Lilly Tadalafil study had an upper level um, inclusion criteria of patients had to walk less than 400 meters in the six minute walk test. And so you can see how that plays out. Now, whether or not this, these patients are all exchangeable for the NSAA, that was an assumption that we made with our model. Um, and, you know, I, I think, if we look here on the next slide, it, it seems reasonable. So this is a spaghetti plot of the NSAA over time for the uh, Tadalafil and Adalorin studies. Um, these two lines, while they are have obviously have a different intercept, are seem relatively parallel over the course of 48 weeks. This is the LME summer leaves uh, linear mixed effects model summaries for the historical data. Tadalafil, um, Adalorin, and then the Pfizer compound, baseline NSAA, the standard deviation of the baseline NSAA, and critically mean change from baseline, and then the standard deviation of the change from baseline and residual error. You can see that these are relatively um, homogeneous. Obviously, not on top of each other, but um, we were we were relatively happy that these these seem to be obviously moving in the same direction with uh, similar variability. Um, in terms of so that was a lot about the the functional endpoint, the NSAA, getting back to dystrophin protein. In our study, we quantified dystrophin through shoulder biopsies in the shoulder. Other studies have, have used the thigh, um, but we, we were using shoulder biopsies. Um, you, in DMD patients, it, it's typical to only collect a baseline biopsy and one post baseline biopsy. So we were getting um, post baseline biopsies at week 12, 22, or 46. Um, the time point of a patient's post baseline biopsy was determined by the randomization order. And then we used dystrophin interim analyses or we conducted dystrophin interim analyses when the biopsy results were available for a specific time point. 
And um, in addition to the dystrophin data from our current study, we had prospectively planned to include the dystrophin data from the phase one OLE study that I talked about earlier that actually ended up discontinuing the study, the whole program. Um, so we used a pretty simple uh, linear model. Just, um, this, the TJ, tau Js are the um, dystrophin levels in the placebo arm, or just, yes, at, at different time points. And then the, I'm just gonna call these theta Ti's are um, associated with the, the treatment effect. So the difference between the, the change from baseline in the, in the treatment arms and the placebo patients. And for the dystrophin analyses, we did specify that we would analyze, um, we would assume that the treatment effects could potentially be different for the high dose and low dose suvidersin arm. Um, and again, we conducted dystrophin analyses to first check whether or not we wanted to stop randomization to the low dose suvidersin arm. So that was the probability and we based this on the probability of the high dose treatment effect being greater than zero. So that's just if, if the high dose is increasing um, dystrophin protein levels and the low dose was increasing dystrophin less than half of the increase um, in, the, in the high dose arm. And this probability had to be greater than 0.95 for us to uh, decide to stop randomization to the low dose arm. Comparisons for treatment efficacy, pretty straightforward. Um, at the first, second, and final dystrophin analysis, this is just one-sided Bonferroni correction. So again, there's a lot of moving, moving parts in this study. And so this is just a, a trial schematic um, of the different interim analyses that we would conduct, assuming um, eight patients enrolled per month. So we enroll the first 30 patients, treat them for 12 weeks. When their biopsies are, dystrophin results based on the biopsies are available, we conduct D1 or dystrophin analysis one. The potential outcome from that analysis was demonstration of efficacy in terms of dystrophin increase, stop enrollment to the low dose arm due to insufficient efficacy. Uh, we just covered that. While this, these, this follow-up and uh, well, this treatment and then the quantification of dystrophin is ongoing, um, patients, additional patients are enrolled. And then after they have 22 weeks of treatment, we would conduct D2 on, on the dystrophin um, results from those patients. While this is ongoing, we conduct N1, N2, N3. These are the analyses to check whether or not we can stop enrollment due to a high probability of NSAA success based on the current patient numbers. Now, again, if we met that threshold, we would not stop the study and declare NSAA success. We would stop enrollment to the study, follow those patients until completion, and then do the NSAA analysis. And then all patients, regardless of the dystrophin um, endpoint analysis results, would be followed for 48 weeks in total, and we would conduct or could conduct a dystrophin analysis at the end and then this NF, that's the final analysis of using all patients who have been enrolled and their follow-up for 48 weeks. That would be the, the um, analysis we would do to see whether or not NSAA uh, treatment efficacy was successful. Okay, so with a complex study, you have complex simulations. So we conducted extensive simulations to understand the operating characteristics of the trial design. And we, through these simulations, we monitored performance metrics, which included probabilities of early and overall success um, for dystrophin, 
uh, effective sample size with the borrowing from the placebo, uh, sorry, historical controls, the mean time to dystrophin success, the mean overall sample size, the probability that we would end up pooling the doses um, for NSAA at the end of the, uh, for the NSAA analysis, uh, mean treatment effect size, et cetera. So we came up with 14 different parameters that defined a simulation, simulation scenario. And these are the 14 parameters. So what we would do is we would pick what we would call a base case. And that's sort of like our best estimate of what the parameter value would be in the, in the clinical trial. And then we did sensitivity analyses where we specified different lower values and higher values for that parameter. And these were chosen not really to, to try to understand what happens when, if we actually really misspecify what's going to happen or what we think is going to happen. Um, so there's, so these are not particularly values that we would expect, but more if things go wrong or our guess is really incorrect, what happens to the operating characteristics of the study? We also studied a range of treatment effects um, for both the dystrophin and uh, on NSAA. And so in total, when we count them all up, we looked at 231 different parameter combinations. Um, so some of the key parameters that I just want to uh, review are were the accrual rate, um, the low dose fraction of the high dose effect. So uh, the base case here was that the, the low dose had about 75% of the, of the treatment effect of the high dose. And then of course, when you're borrowing placebo uh, or historical data, one of the key parameters is the mean change in the placebo patients. Um, we set the base case to be minus 4.06, which was the mean of the historical data sets that we had, and then looked at what would happen if the patients, the placebo patients in the distance 51 study progressed faster or slower. And then uh, obviously looked at changes in the variance components and the residual error. So these are the dystrophin simulation results, um, looking at the base case. Um, this is the increase in dystrophin for the, the high dose arm. So you can see that these are relatively small increases in dystrophin. So with a biomarker like dystrophin included in a study where you're powering for a clinical endpoint, you obviously then have very high power for um, relatively small changes in the biomarker. Um, this is the mean months to um, dystrophin success. And you can see, uh, not surprisingly, that that goes down as the dystrophin increase uh, goes up. The, um, let's see, what a, just that we had relatively high power, especially at uh, the second dystrophin analysis. Um, you did, we did not need much dystrophin increase to show us, uh, uh, to declare a success on dystrophin. So this objective of trying to show dystrophin um, efficacy earlier on in the study was definitely worth implementing. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, some of the criteria that we had put in for the probability of dropping the low dose um, based on that, that that prob the probability of showing certain efficacy on dystrophin on the high dose uh, and then half uh, on, on the low dose, that not surprisingly, that, was, that did not happen very frequently because in the base case, like I said earlier, the low dose had 75% of the efficacy of the high dose. So almost we didn't see any dropping. In other si simulations, when we were looking at, okay, well, what happens if say there's 50% of the efficacy or there's no efficacy in the low dose, then we do see actually uh, a more, more um, a larger percentage of the, of the simulations would have resulted in dropping the low dose arm. 
This is the base case simulation results for the NSAA. Um, this is the treatment of the multiplicative treatment effect. So 0 0.4 is a 40% slowing in the, in the change or the progression of NSAA in the, in the high dose arm. The mean effective sample size, um, I forgot to mention that as after we applied our inclusion criteria to the, um, the historical data sets, we were left with 192 patients and um, the mean effective sample size borrowed, I'll show how we calculated that, that was in around 50 or around 45. So that represents about a, you know, a one third increase in the effective sample size of a, of a clinical trial. Cumulative probability of success. And this means that at these different recruitment targets or randomization targets, did we stop enrollment based on that, um, that criterion that I showed earlier? And you can see that most often the case, even at a 40% treatment effect, you, we did not stop early. Or did not stop enrollment early. And that was really based on the really conservative um, threshold that we, that we applied. We had conversations with our, our chief medical officer and I think it was, it's hard for some people, you know, even me to, to accept you, the potential case where you say, okay, we've done this interim analysis and the probability of success at the end of the study is X, so we recommend stopping enrollment. But there is this small probability that at the end of the trial, um, our NSAAA analysis will fail. And so I think people just are not comfortable with that. And so we ended up having this really conservative um, rule, which basically did not meet, which meant that we needed an enormous treatment effect um, to stop enrollment early. So this is just the um, a figure showing the effective sample size borrowed from the historical data. We calculated it looking at, so the sum over the beta Ks is the um, change from overall change from baseline in the placebo arm. The standard error for that um, without borrowing, so, so just the, the placebo patients in the distance 51 study, divided by the standard error if we included the historical borrowing from those three different studies, um, and then multiply that by N. That's our effective total sample size, including the historical patients. So the effective sample size borrowed is then just NH minus, minus N, which is the, the number of patients, 50 patients in the placebo arm. And you can see that then uh, one thing I did want to note here is you can see how the dynamic borrowing actually plays, plays out. So this vertical line is the mean um, decrease in the NSAA in the historical data sets. As the placebo mean moves away from that, you see that decrease in the effective sample size borrowed. So that's sort of the, the dynamic borrowing um, in action. So this is just a figure showing the uh, power on the y-axis and the NSAA treatment effect um, on the x-axis for the case of borrowing and uh, not borrowing. And I had highlighted before that 40% treatment um, effect. If we have that, then with borrowing, we have about a 20% increase in the power of the study. This um, is an illustration. One of the ways we summarized the sensitivity analyses that we conducted, um, again, looking at the base case and then those different, um, different um, high and low cases. One thing I should have also mentioned was that the way we did these sensitivity analyses is sort of the one factor at a time. So we had the base case, and then we would change one factor, one parameter from the base case to the, to the low value and then to the high value. Um, and each time we change, it would only be keeping all of the other parameters um, 
fixed at the base case. So it, it's really just seeing, okay, what happens if one of these parameters is off, sort of one parameter at a time simulation. So this is just a, a figure of, again, just summarizing the different sensitivity analyses. On the left-hand side, this is the type one error rate. And on the right-hand side, this is the, the power for these different um, sensitivity analyses. And then just sort of a blow up of the case that you know, you're all, all familiar with if um, you're borrowing historical data and your placebo arm in your clinical trial decreases less than, you know, progresses more slowly than the historical data, then you see the telltale um, increase in the type one error rate. Um, so in addition to those different parameters, looking, looking at the sense, conducting sensitivity analyses on the different parameters and what happens in, if we change the values of those, we also wanted to see, okay, well, what happens if we change some of the assumptions on the prior distributions for some of the key, um, key variables in the model? So the data source random effect dictates the amount of historical data borrowing. Um, again, if the variability between the data sets is high, then there is less borrowing. This was the, the, the prior distribution that we specified. And we wanted to see what happens if we change the range of the uniform prior for this uh, sigma delta. So we changed the upper bound of um, the sigma delta. And you can see that it's relatively, or it's robust to changing that, that upper bound um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the prior distribution. Um, the reason for this is that, the reason why it is robust is because the three data sets that we have are were really quite similar. And so that variability between data sets was relatively low. So um, the posterior distribution was not really impacted much at all by this upper bound in the prior. Um, so that's a lot of, about the modeling or the design, the modeling and the simulations. I'll just talk briefly about um, our CID experience. It really was an excellent opportunity for WAVE to collaborate with uh, the FDA statistical leadership as well as the re review division. It was, um, these were really well attended meetings with um, representation of st statisticians across different offices and divisions. Um, you know, while I guess uh, while I'm talking, I want to thank some of the FDA statisticians who were really involved. Um, uh, Dion Price, Laura Lee Johnson, and Greg Levine. They were they were really engaged and uh, collaborative as as we went through this process. Um, one thing that I felt was particularly helpful is we were give getting insights from reviewers or statisticians with experience in different therapeutic areas. And you really felt like they were championing some of these methods that we were, we were talking about. Um, one thing that was, re was really apparent pretty on, early on is that the CID meetings were not really brainstorming sessions. It was not, let's, let's talk about these designs, what should we use, um, things like that. It, it was not, it was not those types of meetings. It was, you know, here's our design. It, it, they felt still like real true FDA meetings where we were trying to um, come to a, a, a common agreement on um, what we were proposing. Um, the timeline was at least specified originally at the CID. I don't know if it changed eventually or, or what, but the timeline was really tight. Um, especially you know, if you're also doing other things like engaging other regulatory agencies. It was, it was really, um, you, know, you, you felt the timeline pressure. Um, so our, you know, for example, our first meeting was at the end of January, 2019. And given the initial specified um, timeline, once after that first meeting, the briefing document for our the second meeting, the CID program had two formal face-to-face -face meetings, as I mentioned. The briefing document for the second meeting was initially due 
um, two weeks after that first meeting, so two weeks after the end of January. And that really was not going to provide sufficient time to, to do anything other than really minor tweaks on, on what we had presented at, in the uh, January meeting. And so um, we definitely needed more time. And so the FDA, we worked and agreed with the FDA that the second meeting was going to be, de be delayed a couple months to provide time for more thorough investigation of uh, the trial. Uh, just some considerations if you are thinking about an innovative trial design or a complex trial. Um, one is that gaining access to historical data uh, was, can be tough. And, and I think is actually getting tougher with some of the privacy laws that are that are being um, implemented, especially in Europe. Um, we were greatly facilitated by the the Critical Path Institute, but getting access to other data sets was really a a time consuming and um, a time consuming endeavor. And so I think if if you're if you're thinking about something like this. Um, you know, you have to take into account that you really can't finalize your simulations and understand the operating characteristics of the clinical trial until you have all of the data, all of your historical data, or at least, um, you know, have inf critical information on those data sets to enable the simulations. Another thing that came up was um, that these endpoints like the NSAA, these, um, instruments and also the training for the NSAA evolve over time, which can potentially complicate the use of historical data. And so we were in the, in the position where the NSAA, at some point, um, the, some of the ordering of the questions changed to, I think, make it easier for the, the patient or the physical therapist to administer the NSAA. And so, um, you know, we were getting questions from FDA about, you know, can you can you talk about what the what the training was, what the documentation of the training was for some of these past clinical trials, uh, and potentially how could that have impacted um, the NSAA levels? And so these are things that. Um, it was hard enough getting access to the data sets. We certainly were not going to get access to training logs and, and things like, and documentation of training from these different clinical trials. So these were going to be things that, um, you know, I was considering them as potential bear traps uh, when we got to the review stage um, for the NSAA. You know, could we really say with confidence that we could use these historical data sets in the way that we were doing? Um, there are plenty of statistical alternatives. Everyone I'm sure had, uh, at this meeting knows that. Um, we kind of just decided uh, we're comfortable with the disease progression model and the way that we were going to be borrowing data. Um, there's always other alternatives out there. And so, um, you know, our, our strategy was to agree to different sensitivity analyses. One of them being uh, inverse probability weighting. So, you know, in, in this this case, you're not not just borrowing everyone that meets your inclusion criteria because they could, you know, your patient populations at, could be different even if you apply the same inclusion criteria. Um, one way to potentially get around that is to use uh, inverse probability weighting, where you're you're sort of more matching on uh, patients with baseline characteristics. Um, I had a, uh, a graduate, a fellow, when I was in graduate school, I had a fellow student who um, knew I was going to go to industry, and he said something along the lines of, oh, Steve, don't you know that you'll never use anything other than what you learn in Bio 201? And Bio 201, was at where I was, was the, the intro um, statistical course for non-biostatistician um, non graduate students. And so um, that's definitely not the case uh, when you're looking at these types of trials. Um, these were, you know, in my mind at least, these are complicated methods that you then need to conduct compu compu complicated and time-consuming simulations. 
And then not only that, it's how to effectively summarize and present um, these different simulations. And so um, <clears throat> at the time we were going through this, I was the only statistician at WAVE. And so it was really crucial that we partnered with um, someone like Barry Consulting to help us um, you know, come up with the right statistical method, the right way to conduct the simulations and the right way to summarize and present these, these analyses. So just a heads up that at least in my book, they, these were, we, these were, this was challenging. Another thing um, that I, I don't think I appreciated enough when we were starting this study was the extensive documentation required upfront. So just as an example, um, prior to starting the study, we wanted to get in place the data monitoring committee charter. That's, that's the independent group that's going to be looking at the interim results. How do they make decisions based on different interim results? Um, the interim, nope, uh, independent statistical center charter. So you'll have a independent group conducting the interim analyses. And this sort of document described how they would get the data, how they would get the treatment effect, uh, sorry, treatment assignments, uh, what they would communicate to the DM, DMC, um, the full statistical analysis plan, and also a data access plan. So this is who sees what and when and how will they get access to it. Um, there's also logistical challenges uh, involved. One of, you know, just for an example, um, we spent a lot of time working with the IVRS system, trying to figure out how we would implement stopping randomization to a specific arm, and um, you know how to change some of these some of these processes that they had in place so that could actually be implemented. And it's it's these types of things that, um, while it may not seem too complicated to implement, it's definitely time consuming at certain points. Um, when you're also trying to get the get the full study underway in engaging with multiple regulatory agencies. Okay, so just um, in summary, uh, the adaptive design that we came up supported the different clinical trial objectives, which were kind of um, driven by these, you know, trying to get accelerated approval um, based on dystrophin with FDA and a functional endpoint um, with other regulatory agencies. As I mentioned, placebo arm augmentation with historical data can be challenging. Uh, the CID program provided a productive sounding board for innovative trial design. Uh, these meetings, again, were, were well attended with um, statisticians. I even made a, um, a joke at the, at the first meeting where I said, I'm finally at an FDA meeting where we have enough statisticians. And it went over OK, not great. Um, the CID program provide, facilitated interactive exchange. Um, and then they, you also felt like the FDA was invested in trying to see that this design was implemented in the right way with the right methods. They gave us flexibility to some things that we needed clarification on with granting us two additional teleconferences in addition to the face-to-face -face meetings. Um, if I was going to do this again, maybe for an Exxon 53 skipping therapy, I would certainly have included a futility dystrophin analysis. Um, if we are going to try to stop enrollment early, it it's, makes more sense to have a more aggressive enrollment stopping, potentially include some sort of group sequential option for the NSAA endpoint. Um, another thing that I think really needs to be considered is study size constraints. We're looking at a rare disease population and actually then mutation specific um, subpopulation. So whether or not we could have actually enrolled 150 patients, um, I think is probably still debatable. Um, you know, innovative trial designs, I think they help with efficient drug development. And, you know, to put this trial into context, when we started Distance 51, there were 17 other trials recruiting this, uh, DMD patients. Uh, so, so trying to make the, mo the most of placebo data, historical data, I think is, is really important for, um, for everyone. And then just a plug for 
uh, a paper that we published uh, in 2020, last year in statistics and medicine, uh, describing in agonizing detail um, everything that I just covered. Um, so I'll just conclude by thanking my collaborators at Barry, Melanie, Scott, and Kristen, and then Jennifer and Mike at WAVE. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Lake, um, for a great presentation. Um, the question and answer session is open now. Uh, I see two messages on the chat. Maybe we can start from there. Oh, so should I go to the messages? Yes, please, if you can. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so the first one, I think, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say, so this is the, is the sum multiplied to the exponentiated component of the whole term? Um, yeah, I believe that has been answered. I think it was a clarification question. Some oh, one of okay. the other right. participants so, answered. So thank you. Well, yeah, so we can go to, to the, the question. Other participant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we can go to John's question. Sure. Um, side effects of act. Yes, I would say um, there were more in, in some of the, it, the drug was infused. So uh, like a lot of infused therapies, there were, were infusion associated reactions. Um, simulations attempt to project for patient dropout. I, I can't recall these, these studies actually in DMD patients, they're, um, they actually have very low dropout. So I, did, we, I don't think we anticipated that there would be, there would be much dropout um, in this in this study, and you can look at some of the prior studies that have been conducted in DMT to to see what it was. It was a really low percentage as opposed to some of the other types of trials I've been involved in. Um, yes, so patients um, after they completed forty eight weeks were going to roll. All, everyone was going to roll into an open label extension study where they would be be treated. I just, this is this is John. I just wanted to say, um, in a placebo-controlled study in children, it would just seem to me that parents don't want their kids on the placebo, and you'd have to really project for that. I would be very surprised that uh, in a DMD study that you wouldn't have to look at that. Uh, I'm sorry. Look at look at at at, at the at the, uh, the placebo. Since you said side effects are evident, yeah. When you when and I'm assuming the study was blinded. I I would just think parents of these children, uh, you know, may want them to go, you know, into an active treatment, and that uh, potentially yeah. there would be that at least the theory is that the dropouts. And I'm surprised that you did not have to look at that for the FDA. Yeah. Um... It's okay. Uh, no, you answered the question. Point. You know, I mean, I, I, I will, I'll say that there definitely have been phase, pretty large phase three trials that have been conducted in DMV that uh, the dropout rate was was very low, including on the placebo arm. So um, I think with the guarantee that that the patients would get um, therapy within forty eight weeks, um, I think that is hopefully motivation for for parents to keep their, their kids in the study. I mean, and I think that, that the low dropout is also reflective of motivated parents keeping, keeping their, their children in the study. You, you mentioned there were 17 other studies ongoing. So I'm just, again, yes. thinking that that's another reason for looking at the dropouts, but I'm gonna stop well, there. I mean, I, I would say, I would say, you know, to follow up on that, the, the Oftentimes, if you are, you know, say, say potentially in an, in, in a, um, it, like our, our study, getting an ASO, if you are treated with that uh, investigational ASO, that would most likely disqualify you from, from 
participating in other studies as well. And they would not have access to their treatment arm assignment um, until the study was concluded. Thank you for an outstanding presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Okay. Um, sorry, I'll just, how did you handle the two primary endpoints for different agencies in terms of multiplicity adjustment? Well, so this is our, um, I guess we, we didn't control for an overall trial analysis type one error rate. What we did was said, okay, this is our analysis. For, this is our SAP for EMA and PMDA. And this is our SAP for, um, for the FDA. And so that was how it's conducted. I've been involved in other development programs where we did something similar with, with slightly different primary endpoints. Um, as dystrophin production has been used as a surrogate endpoint to support accelerated approval. Uh, well, so we would, our, yes, so our plan was that if we were successful on the NSAA endpoint, then we would, we would seek full approval from FDA, um, hopefully after, you know, after the accelerated approval. And I, and I think this was this would be our confirmatory study baked into the the study um, or over the study for uh, accelerator approval. Right. Um, that this is a really good question about. So again, when to determine stop enrollment due to the high probability of success for NSAA was. The historical data borrowed in that calculation. Actually, I should have mentioned that it actually wasn't. So, so what we did was, um, we would to come up with that sample size specific criterion. Uh, the simulation, the analyses on the NSAA saying, okay, if seventy patients, what did the mean treatment effect have to be? It was based on, it did not incorporate the placebo borrowing into that. So, um, uh oh, this sounds like a tough question. Can you go back to the Bayesian progression model page? All right, hold on. Okay. Hold on, sorry. Okay. Actually, I don't know if I can then see the, the chat that. So um, yeah, so Lirika, you can uh, probably unmute yourself to ask the question. Perhaps that will be easy for uh, Steve. Yep. Oh, sure. Um, uh, let me know, can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Sort of. Oh, thanks. So I, uh, I uh, could, you, could you share a little bit more about how would you, um, how you would interpret the, 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 the interceptor term is like gamma, gamma I, and then you also have exponent to uh, eta I and then alpha X I. So I, I think you said X I is the baseline covariance and the, this gamma, gamma I somehow linked to baseline covariance and uh, but this you have this eta i and xi linked to this uh, progression effects so how how do you interpret those uh, right effects? so so the gamma i that's basically their um, baseline um, which usually is around i can't i can't remember 25 or something like that and then the the alpha that is the, those are the, that's the effect on the, the overall progression. That's the multiplicative effect on the overall progression. And same with the eta I's, that's the multiplicative, patient specific multiplicative effect. Sort of like a, like I was saying earlier, sort of like a random slope effect, but in this um, piecewise linear context. So why 
um, sorry, uh, I uh, this uh, this is my first time uh, see a uh, progression model, patient progression model. So why do you separate the eta i and the x i then? So what the, what's the difference between those two terms? It, well, so this is based on uh, patient specific uh, characteristics. This is more of like getting at the the variability in the in the slope. So I think this. This is pretty much similar to what you would see in a, um, you know, an equivalent analogous to what you would see in a random effects model, where you would have a random patient specific random of slope sort of error term. And then the slope could also be dictated by um, covariates. So this is something that, you know, you're explicitly modeling how the slope changes based on observed baseline covariates. And then I would say the, the eta i's are more patient specific uh, variability. That's not measured by the baseline covariates. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks. So yeah. it seems to me the beta k is like a time changing covariance, loosely speaking. Can I, can I interpret that way? Because beta k depends on your time interval, is that correct? So every 12 weeks period, you have a different beta k corresponding to those. You have four different uh, 12 weeks period. So you, you, you have four different beta k's. Yeah, I mean, I, what I was thinking about it is, is really the, the beta k's are, if you, if you take the mean, you know, I don't know, assuming complete follow-up or something like that, you take the mean for the placebo patients at each time point and then connect the dots. <laughs> that, that's how I was thinking of the sum. And then you basically, you know, to calculate the, um, the change over time is you just sum up, sum up these different components over time. So if everything was linear, you know, you would really only need one beta. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so there's one more question uh, on the chat. Um, okay. Well, I think other trials have been longer. Um, we were thinking that, yeah, you know, there's there's been a lot of analyses on conducted on. Um, the available DMD uh, clinical trial data. And, you know, I, I would say it is pretty clear that the patients do progress over 48 weeks in DMD. Um, you know, you can just look at, look at the lines that I was plotting for NSAA prior to that. Um, I, I would say a lot of the studies that are conducted now um, are around 48 weeks. I mean, maybe, maybe they are too short. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at clinical trials now for in, in at wave in, in different disease indications. And it's clear that some of the trials have that have been conducted in some of these other disease, um, have been too short. So, uh, based on our modeling, based on the analysis that have been, has been done by different groups, um, uh, we were, we were relatively comfortable with 48 weeks. Yeah, if there are any more questions, please unmute yourself. Um, I don't see anybody talking. Okay. Great. Okay, that sounds good. So. Uh, was there anybody asking a question? Sorry. Uh, I don't see any. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Lake, for such a wonderful presentation. And thanks to all the participants um, and um, joining this uh, first lecture in this uh, KOL CID mini series. Um, we will be continuing um, our lecture series in the upcoming months. Um, thanks for joining and um, uh, have a great weekend. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Bye. thank you. Bye.